Moving on to our special guest, um, really excited to talk to this fellow, um, very, very smart guy, has been around the NBA, has been around betting, has been around numerous different things and walks of life. But what I want to do, Pro, I want, I want you to introduce him with his full name, Pro. Can you give that a shot? Bob, Jimmy the Greek Vulgaris. Is that all right to say or how do you want to say it? H. Bob, I mean- That's not his full name. I don't know. I, I know him as Jimmy the- He wouldn't fucking talk to me when, when I was in Dallas. I just called him Jimmy the Greek. I didn't even know his real name. <laughs> Haralbos Vulgaris. There you go. Haralbos. Nailed it. Yeah, it's Nailed a silent, it. silent A, isn't it? It is a little bit of a silent. Yeah, it, that's, it is. That's right. Some people some people, people just go by Bob, but yeah, if you can get the first name right, it's all, it always always feels a little bit better. I, I had no fucking idea, Bogues, to be honest with you, 100%. I worked with a guy for a year. I had no fucking idea that that was his real name. Yeah, you're also confused with the name John and why there's a H in it. So we'll get into that <laughs> no doubt about another, it. another day. But yeah, well, welcome to the show, H-Bob. We'll call you H-Bob or Bob. Um, I wanted to get you on for, for a number of number of weeks and months, and we've, we've kind of gone back and forth. But for everyone out there, I'll just give an intro of how we met. We met playing poker online, funnily enough, even though you were at the Mavs, we brief, briefly probably shook hands and said hello, but that was about the extent of it when I was at the Mavs, you were kind of in the shadows back then. But um, yeah, pro, this dude this dude railed me for um, being in one of the slowest percentiles when I played for the Mavs pro. So we got off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what the fuck he's talking about then. No, you probably you probably beat me in a pot, and I was probably irritated. <laughs> That's probably where that comment came from. Yeah, no, nah, we're going back and forth. I, I didn't, I didn't lead. I didn't lead with it. That's for sure. It was. It's the truth. You you weren't. I was. I was running on one leg that whole season and slowing down in my career. So I'm not going to hide from it. I was one of the slow dudes in the NBA. This dude's like, we're going back and forth, talking shit, firing up. Funnily enough, and uh, that was my first rendezvous with H Bob, but. I mean, I didn't really know much about you, to be honest. Um, I, I to you know, Phil Helmuth, of course, gave me you know your resume and your social security number and, and every detail about you. But other than that, I did some reading, and and obviously, you've had a really interesting life to this point, and that's what we want to get into early. You've been labelled as the NBA's greatest better ever. Now, that's that's a pretty big title. But before we get to that, just tell us about your upbringing. Obviously, Greek heritage, um, Greek family. Your father, I believe, was an avid avid gambler. Loved to have a bit of a punts. Um, grew up in Canada, just just break us through all that, and, and we'll get to how you got involved with, with betting a little bit later. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I grew up in Canada, Greek Greek Canadian parents. Both my parents, born and raised in Greece, moved to Canada uh, independently when they were quite young. I think my mom moved when she was around seventeen or eighteen. My dad in his early twenties. They met up there. My dad got a job uh, washing dishes at Kentucky Fried Chicken. That was his first job in Canada, I believe. Kind of built himself up. Um, was was pretty successful at, at one point, especially in my early, early days. But then I think he had a lot of Canadian strip malls and the mortgage crisis in Canada or the interest rates went really high. And so he, he kind of lost most of his money doing that. He definitely was a gambler. So I grew up around the racetrack, the horse racetrack, and then kind of got involved in NBA basketball. I think around the time I a friend of mine gave me like a direct TV card that gave you like all the channels or something like that. So I was just watching, started watching basketball around then, then went to Vegas with my dad one year in between high school and university and kind of fell in love with the game then, watching the game in the sports book. I mean, I, that's, I think that's like a, a standard way of falling in love with basketball is watching it from you know, Caesars Palace sports book. Is, is that similar to you, how you, <laughs> how you guys uh, fell in love with the game? That's yeah. how I fell in love with the game. No, it's, it's interesting. I mean, then you went off to school, obviously, um, met, a, met a bunch of different people along the way. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, similar to kind of mine in a way where, you know, immigrant parents, we, we opted for Australia instead of Canada. So that's why I thought, you know, when I read about, you know, it's not like you started with a, you know, a trust fund that old dad loaned you to, to put some bets on and made it big. Your, your, you know, your, your story is literally the ultimate grind of, of, a, of a success and kind of what you'd, what you'd make a movie about. I was actually, um, yeah, my dad had a little bit of money when I was younger, like I mentioned, but me, me and my brother actually looked after our family. I would say when I was in my 20s, my brother's 10 years old, he's in 30s, like we were actually, I mean, when my parents went bad financially, we were, we actually, I, had, I was working as a sky cap at the airport while I was going to university and was making quite a bit of money actually was making a sky cap, but I was working like 65 hours a week, some weeks in the summertime. Um, but yes, I was saved up a bit of money, was gambling a little bit more than obviously I think everyone's kind of heard the story of me putting my sky cap savings, which was I think at the time was around sixty or seventy thousand Canadian. I forget exactly. I, it was around fifty thousand American, whatever the exchange rate was. 
uh, on the Lakers to win the NBA championship in 2000. That went well or 90, whatever it was, 99, the year, first well, year Phil Jackson was their coach. What did they give you? Six and a half to one. Oh. It was a pretty bad bet. Oh, it was a pretty shit. bad bet. It was a pretty bad bet to be perfectly honest, just because, I mean, I, I, I didn't really, I wasn't like super sophisticated about gambling back then, but I would never do a futures bet like that now where you're tying up so much of your bankroll. I wasn't betting on credit. I had to bet. I had to like post up. So I was like sending cashiers checks to all these like random offshore sports books. I think the Greek was one of the ones that took a bigger bet for me, bet Chris, Caribbean, a bunch of different ones that were around then. So I kind of spread it around that way. And then and I just grinded away in university, just kind of like forgot about it, didn't really pay much attention until the playoffs, and then it started to get a little more serious once they once they got to the playoffs. And that was their first that was their first chip, right? In the in the three P? Yeah. I started betting them. I actually I went to I went to Vegas again that year just before I think before I went to school, before I took a week in between university starting and went there during the beginning of the season. And I think Kobe was hurt at the start of this the preseason. And they went down and they had the triangle. They had like AC green was playing like significant minutes. The whole thing was kind of ridiculous, but they definitely had a system in place that kind of led me to believe that I watched them the previous year in the playoffs and they just weren't a very, I mean, they were a really talented core, but they just didn't really have any type of coaching philosophy in terms of how they played offense. And so I, I was like a big Phil Jackson fan at the time. Um, he was certainly pretty good at managing egos and so that was kind of the whole impetus of that kind of kind of wanted to get to be perfectly frank just wanted to get out of winnipeg that was the main thing and i thought okay i can sit here i was living in my brother's basement i can save up money and grind my way out and then maybe move out of winnipeg in like six or seven years or i can just take a shot maybe try to fast forward my life five or six years and get out of there sooner that's kind of what i did and it obviously it worked out really well and that was that was pretty lucky for me and then that was but then I just had a decent bankroll to start taking betting a lot more seriously. And is that when you you see so basically trampoline straight into from from that from those winnings straight into the next phase, which we talk about now, where you know at one point you were you're almost seventy percent win rate with your bets. Is is that where you transition straight to, or was it kind of a baby step to get to that point? A little bit of baby steps. I was betting Canadian football also. Um, which was really easy Canadian to beat football. at the time. <laughs> wow. Canadian football was Canadian football was probably the easiest sport to beat. I think of like it was crazy. They expanded to the United States one year, and these teams would play like a game in the American arena or maybe American stadium. Excuse me, then go play in Canada. And some of the American state, like guys don't know Canadian football. The field is bigger, it's wider. The end zones are twenty yards instead of ten yards. But the American stadiums didn't have the big enough stadiums to do all that stuff. So you'd be watching a game where the end zone would be like 14 and a half yards deep on one side because it had like a kind of like a trapezoid feature to it because they couldn't make it all as big. So there was just a lot of like interesting angles you could play. Like you could bet the unders almost exclusively in the American stadiums to start because people didn't really realize that the stadiums weren't as wide. They weren't as long. It was just, there's just a lot of really easy edges in Canadian football. The lines weren't very good. And there, I had a guy that was able to get down quite a bit of money for me. So I was doing that. Um, as far as basketball goes, yeah, I had a subset of plays. Ba betting back then was just a lot easier, obviously. So there was a subset of plays that had a very, very high win rate, like 67 to 70%. But you'd only have about 200 of those plays a year. It wasn't like you'd have, you know, when I was betting at my peak, I was making upwards of 1,800 or 2,000 bets a year, just to give you an idea, with a win rate of like 55 to 56%, maybe as high as what, 56 and a half some years. What's the average that you bet, Bob, uh, Bob, on that stuff? Like, what, What's the average you bet on a game at that point in your career? When I was first starting out, I was betting out like very small amount. After I won the Lakers bet, I, I think I was betting like five and 10,000 a game, pretty big mm -hmm. unit size for, sure. for then. At the, but, at the, but that was that was pretty big degeneracy also. Um, I would say the first year I kind of discovered the subset of plays that I had that were really high win rate. I also met a guy who was one of the, I guess the biggest bookmaker in Canada. I had beat him for a little while and then he decided he wanted me to work with him. It was kind of a weird situation. Like, <laughs> like some, some Italian mafia guy basically says, we're going to be partners <laughs> from now on. I had no idea who this guy was, but I, Someone told me, no, he's a good guy. You're fine. He's, he, he's going to treat you well. So he ended up helping me get down a lot of my, this is like 2001. He ended up like getting, helping me get down a lot of my bets 
And during that time, I was betting 60 to 75 to 80,000 a game just because the win rate was so high. What he was betting fuck? on credit. But that, but you know, that was, that was, that was a very short lived time in terms of how much you could bet. The, the market got a little bit sharper around 2005. The last year, I, I think the last year I was betting was around 2014 or 2015. And that year, my average bet was probably around 120 a game, 125. Some games we'd get down like two or 300,000. Um, but that would be really rare. Wow. Yes. That's, that's big numbers. I mean, Australia, a lot of us, most of our listeners are in Australia because pro is not really bringing much to the table. But um, yeah, a, a lot of punters in Australia would be mind blown by that. Australia is obviously a huge gambling nation, um, especially on horses and greyhounds and, and sports. So a lot of our listeners will be mind blown with that. But you um, you found a flaw. I actually had, I actually had a funny, I actually had a funny, I just remembered this now. Sorry to interrupt you. There was, I, I forget if it was Tab Core. Is that the name of the, is there one yeah, of the TAB companies? Tab. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we had a guy in Australia who was sending us these, the, the, there was this market in Australia, which is like, you could bet on what the highest scoring quarter would be in a game in the NBA. And you could bet like, and you'd get usually the first quarter on in general would be the highest score, but there'd be some teams where the third or fourth quarter would be the highest scoring quarter, just based on different coaching strategies, et cetera. And so they would put these markets up in Australia and we beat them for like, I don't think it wasn't a lot of money, but it, it must've been a lot of money for them because they stopped offering that market like six months into the season <laughs> because, we, because we just had like such a huge edge on some of these bets. We'd get like three to one on the third quarter that would just, you know, we had the third quarter at being 50% or better to be the highest scoring quarter just based on the, the, the matchup and the rotation patterns and coaching strategies, et cetera. But yeah, I remember the, but then we, we couldn't get a lot of money down, but we had a little, we had a guy, a friend of mine who lived in Australia who would go around a tab core and make all these bets. I, I think it was tab core. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, that was a long time ago. But they yeah. don't, and they don't like losing. So when the, as soon as they start losing, um, like you said, that <laughs> whatever bet you're putting down is either going to disappear, or what they do now is they actually cap, you know, how much you can put on something, especially if you're if you're a new new account or new gambler. Bob, how did you do studying back then? Did you did you have an analytics team back then, or did you just do it by feel? Did you how, what was some type of system that you had back then? When I first started out, I just watched a ton of basketball games. I had like five different VCRs hooked up to my direct TV receivers. Now it's just recording mm -hmm. all the games. This is 2000. Around mm -hmm. 2005, play-by-play -play data, there was like three or four, maybe five years of play-by-play -play data then, which is pretty decent data. That was all the data that you really had up until Second Spectrum and Sport View installed cameras in the ceilings of the arenas, which... I didn't have access to it until I started working for the team and I wasn't gambling when I was working for the team. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, primarily started out via feel. Um, and then why, as, as more data became available, started getting more and more into the data aspect of it, hired some really, really sharp math, like one really, really sharp mathematician in particular, went through a bunch before I found them. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then it was like, so we did the tab core stuff. It was all mathematically modeled. We have a, we had a simulation that would predict the outcome of a basketball game based on, you know, you know, simulating each each touch and how you know whether a play would end in a turnover, or a shot. If it was a shot, would it be rebounded by the defense, the offense, the likelihood of a foul, etc. Simulate the game ten thousand times and then get get a prediction from there. Holy um, shit! And that was called Ewing, right? Yeah, that was the first one. Was called Ewing. Our second version was called Harden, and then because the second one used a little bit more of 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 the end result data that we had uh, and then combined the two of them towards the tail end of when I was betting. And that was actually really powerful when the two, the two models were combined into one aggregate outcome. That was the, that was probably like the, I I'm sure you, you might, you know, you heard the nuts, right? Bulbs. I mean, that was the nuts. I mean, when this thing, like when this thing spit out a recommendation and both models kind of had a high, a high rate of agreements with it, it would be a very, very high likelihood result that it would be a good bet. And so I'm, I'm that's guessing, when we really started betting a lot. I'm guessing the mathematician you hired, you shit, shit all about basketball. Would that be correct? He, he, he didn't know anything about basketball. In fact, <laughs> one of our first, our, I think our first model output that we had, we had like a three or four point uh, bias towards games being higher scoring than normal. And it was because he didn't, he put that, he, he just, we hardwired the free throw shooting for like league wide. And he had the average league wide average free throw shooting at like 90% instead of 70, whatever percent that it was. And that was just like, it was just the first iteration, but it was funny because he couldn't figure out what was wrong. <laughs> it should have, it should have lined up right with the average. And he was like, well, how, you know, how, how does, 
I mean, he just didn't have any idea about anything. He, he had to explain everything to this guy. It was kind of interesting. But once once we started working together a little bit more closely, it was it was a pretty good partnership. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's just amazing that you know people that break down numbers like yourself and and the whiz. That's what he's called uh, reportedly. His name's still not stated to this day. Smart smart doing. You don't want anyone to poach him from you. Um, the H Bob. But yeah, I mean, just the fact that raw data and numbers and, and guys that can study this like yourself early on especially can follow and, and make predictions on something that they, ha- they technically have no idea about like basketball or whatever it is it's, it's just kind of amazing of, of how much ai and data gives you yeah it's, it's really cool yeah for sure it's really interesting because i always i would always talk about and this is like kind of kind of relates a little bit to like my time with the mavs a little bit but i would, I would talk to some guys that weren't really into data at all and this is kind of the line i would give them would be like like, I don't believe in data. I just watch film. I don't, you know, uh, numbers don't really tell the whole story, which I agree with. You have to kind of combine both. But like the one thing I would, I would say is like, if you don't believe in data is like, who knows more about you, your wife or Google? Like <laughs> there's just no chance <laughs> your wife, I don't care how long you've been married, how close your relationship is. Like Google just knows more about you than your wife. Does, unless you don't spend time on a computer. But if you spend time on a computer and you are searching a lot, like Google just knows like the stuff you're clicking on, how long you're, how much time you're spending on different ads etc cetera, etc cetera. like your your you know google instagram those those model ais know more about you than you know about yourself and the idea that you would discount data for a sport like basketball when they have a camera taking picture of the court 24 times a second to me it's just it's it's kind of nonsense but i kind of get why there's a hesitancy to it if you're like an old school guy who grew up around the game and you also don't really understand the numbers so it kind of scares you a little bit you might feel like you might get you know become like a dinosaur yeah, extinct left at behind, some point. for sure 100 percent. i mean for sure you know yeah. i think pros you know we have this debate all the time and i'm i'm, I'm i like you know we like a bit of analytics I, i'm kind of in in-game coaching feels important but but so are the numbers i've, I've really come more towards the middle with all that um but yeah i mean it's a lot of the old schoolers i think that's where the hesitancy comes from it's like the big shiny new thing that I know nothing about scares me. And that's what we're seeing in the NBA. You know, I think there's a lot of coaches that are now have to have a guy like yourself or someone working next to him. Uh, and the ones that don't, are, are just like you said, becoming dinosaurs. But anyway, let's, let's get back. You, the flaws you found were interesting because when you read it, it's just so, such a no brainer, especially the main one you found was um, the bookies prices where the total points for the first and second half of NBA games were exactly, exactly half of the predicted game total. So for those that don't understand, usually NBA games, there's, there's more points that scored in the second half because intentional fouling comes into play. Um, teams so are actually more points in the, it's actually more points in the first half. College has that. Where the second half is higher scoring, but it's for a different way, reason. Way to go, folks! <laughs> but um, but there's a, I mean, there's like a weird, there's like a weird dynamic as to why that happens, and that was like a big part of my edge. And some people are still doing that. I don't really want to blow their their angle up, but yeah, there's just like there's lots of different tendencies team wide based on certain things the coach wants to do, substitution patterns. Like you said, some teams like Jerry Sloan used to foul a lot, even down like twelve points at six seven, sixteen seconds left, the guy'd be fouling. There's a little bit of that would come into play. Um, and then you'd have situations towards the end of the year where it would be really profitable. Like there was a year when Gilbert Arenas played for Golden State. I think it was his first year with Golden State or maybe his second year. But he didn't play till like the second second yeah. half of the season towards the tail end yeah. of the season. Yeah. And I mean, their games were so high scoring in the first half. Like they couldn't make it. Let's say like imagine imagine the total was 215. Like the right first half number there would probably be like 120 because they were playing so fast with him and he was primarily getting his minutes in the first half, primarily playing fast. And then the game would tighten up. So like little things like that, you kind of try to get a handle on. Um, I was kind of well known as like the totals guy. That's all I really bet were totals. And that's kind of true, kind of isn't. But I, I, I led people b- to believe that that was true because when we actually had a, a full game side model that was super profitable, we wanted to be able to have some beards bet those for us without people thinking it was automatically me. Um, which is a problem that I always had when I was gambling was people would always like, if someone who was winning on the NBA, they would just assume oh, that he's getting Bob's picks or those must be Bob's picks and that person would get cut off. <laughs> so you'd try to, a big part of your thing, a big part of your edge was trying to find like a rich whale to make your bets or disguise your bets, hide your bets, you know, do like all kinds of head fakes. The whole thing was just kind of, kind of interesting looking back, but it was also super aggravating because you're dealing with all of these people that you have to be partners with 
you know, these Goombas, guys like Pro, you know, the pro hey, 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 hey. <laughs> all the guys that Pro know growing up, you have to deal with all of, you know, but like there's a lot of them are really good people, but you're just constantly having to find new people like that to find bets. Cause I, if I roll into a sports book and use my name, they're just going to, I want to bet big money on the NBA. They're going to be like, why the fuck would I ever book this guy's bets? This guy's it's like when, it's like when uh, pro shows up at Sizzler and the all you can eat buffet and the, the light starts flashing. <laughs> like do not, I, I'm do not, not a meat this. guy. It's more of a pot. Yeah. If, you, if you're telling me a pasta place. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. All you can eat. Don't let this guy in this Homer Simpson. I love the fact that Bob remembered that I got mafia ties when I was growing up though. I appreciate that. That's great. <laughs> you would always, you, you'd always talk about that stuff during those, would be like the big the big jokes well, always you didn't respect when anything. i was gonna get arrested <laughs> yeah <laughs> you didn't, gonna... <laughs> you, hey folks he he respected nothing i had to say at the table as far as basketball so i had a fuck with him about tom foolery mob stuff and him being jimmy the greek betting on games which he did, obviously didn't bet on games but i like to bust his fucking balls about it which is great that's not true that i didn't respect your work and i know you know that that's not true i actually did I actually came to respect you a lot more or appreciate you a lot more after you were gone, to be perfectly honest. Oh, I, I thought some of the stuff that you were doing with some of our players was help was really helpful and key. Like, obviously you worked primarily with Luca your first year there, the first year I was there. Yeah. That was like the main guy you were working hey, with. Let me, let me clear that up. I never really worked with Luca. I was his guy. I was his sounding board. And I just, cause no one else would really fucking talk to the kid. And I would like, I would like bust his balls. And then like, I just fucking be around talking to him. But, but you yeah, also no, worked I, out a lot. You did a lot of skill stuff with them. Like you should be, a little I mean, bit. you did a lot of that. A little bit. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to get a job off the kid, but yeah. What I like about you is you, there's so many people who have tried to attach themselves to this Ooh. guy's success. Bob, here's the thing. I knew the fuck I was getting fired already in tri <laughs> before training camp i knew i was fucking getting out of there right why did you know you were getting fired how did um, that happen me and carlisle were like fucking i ran in iraq especially at that last year and i won't go back i won't get into it but i knew i was gone there was no fucking chance in life so like i just sat there and did whatever i needed to do like I, I i didn't try to like attach myself to anybody to try to save my job i knew it was like a fucking count you remember the countdown meter till fucking the year 2000 and then fucking everybody thought the computer was going to shut off. That was my countdown. And I knew I was out. So I didn't give a, but I didn't give a fuck. I just knew. So, you know, look, I did my job. I didn't try to like, I didn't try to like make any last second fucking Hail Marys to save my job. I liked you. You were around. I like fucking around with you. I hung out with you and Sham, DK. And then I did what I did. But uh, yeah, I didn't want to off track. As those, two guys, by, those two guys, by the way, are as great of two people as I've ever worked with ever fan fucking fan fucking tastic both of them yeah both just them. really enjoyed yeah. that. Sham, sham god and um dk was the um essentially team psychologist sports right psychologist. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sports psychologist mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but it's really solid really solid people i mean so so i appreciated the work that you did just because i felt like you know you had a real i mean you 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 were specifically there to help players get better you were a skill and development guy sham's a great one as well but aside yes. from that i felt like there there wasn't a ton of coaching staff members that were like big on player development you guys were the main ones and so once you left then it was just sham and sham's like yeah. working everybody out you know yeah. <laughs> i mean i would go to i would be like oh i would I, we'd be t talking about players that need to improve this we need to prove that and there's only so many hours in a day that i mean peter Pan, yeah. i guess is the other one but that you would yeah. get where sham could actually be able to work with everyone we had rookies it was very so that's why having you around i, I appreciate when you're around because you're just another guy that could go and work on skills with players yeah, and that's a big thing. The players got to keep on improving their adding to their toolbox, especially as the game keeps on changing as much as it has. Yeah, especially so. if you're not playing too. A lot of those guys that pro work with generally, you know, could, could have been, you know, guys that fall out of rotation, guys that need to get extra reps up. So for, you know. Yeah, I was more of a cat. I was more of a catfish as far as like, like bottom. No, seriously, like bottom feeding, like as far as guys who didn't play. Like Luca, again, the whole thing with Luca is he didn't play summer league. And like I just attack, like I just started fucking around with him, talking to him, and nobody really talked to him because he wasn't gonna play summer league. And then I, I don't know if they were intimidated or what, but I just fucking talked to him. But like everybody else, like Ryan broke off, you know, all these guys that like didn't play. That we like, you know how it, you know how it is, Bob. Like, you know, you're not gonna get on Twitter fucking working out guys who don't play. So like, there's not gonna be a lot of people who jump to work out guys like that. And I'd rather work out guys like that to try to. You know, maybe make them like from the 12th guy to the 10th guy and grind it out like that. Yeah. So 
Let's get off me because no one wants to talk. No one wants yeah, to hear a fat fuck talk. I'm, pro. I'm, I'm liking this, H Bob. You're grilling. Yeah, me. no He's shit. Starting, hey, Bob, let's sweat. come on every other week. Yeah, come on every other week. <laughs> that would be great. No, go ahead, right. man. So go back to your stuff. So we get we get back from the betting. You obviously do real well for a number of years, and then um, talk us through the losses. Um, you had a long run. Um, it's, it's quoted as Bob hit the wall in two thousand four when he went on a long run of losses, losing a third of his bankroll in one month. Is this is this true? Is it are they sugar coated that? And and what happened? I, book- I lost like I lost a third of not my total bankroll, but like the like not my, all my money, but the money I was using to bet that year. So I had some other stuff. I had some investments and some other stuff that I was trying to diversify out of. But yeah, it was in 2004. So I think like, it's funny because looking back, I, I thought my edge had disappeared because I had like this ridiculous edge on this subset of plays. But my edge didn't disappear. It just went from being like where I was stealing to where I still had, where I had a chance to lose. And so I started to press a little bit. I don't think I was making great decisions. The, the main part about that is that kind of made me lean more into, into having like an actual model versus because you guys can relate to this is is when you're gambling and you're making like you're the final decision maker and it's your subjective view but you're having a bad day or you're like you had a fight with your girlfriend you had this something happened like it totally affects or you have like you're on a losing streak like you don't think as clearly i wasn't nearly the robot that i am now or i just don't maybe yeah yeah, i I don't want really tilting it's just like you don't make the right it's hard to make the Mm. right decision and so that was more of why I leaned on more on the, on, on having, I wanted to have a model built because I wanted something that could just be perfectly transparently unbiased at all times. And, and so having that as like a kind of like a crucible that you could lean on was important to me. And so I spent more time devoted to that. I also started playing a little bit of a poker around then. I think that was so 2004 was like, like my worst year around that stretch, but I still won money that year. It's just, I was up so much in the first half of the season. And then gave a lot of it back in the last third of the season. Last two, last last little bit of the season was was for the most part. I mean, I can't remember exactly when what went down, but it wasn't it wasn't a great year that year. But it, it certainly wasn't like a massive losing year either. Yeah, it's on record saying that then you you employed a different style of of, of a more grinding style of betting um, post that. Yeah, some smaller bets, smaller bets on edges over a longer amount of time. Yeah, not even so much. Yeah, not even so much like smaller bet sizes, just. Like the way I would look at it, it would be like, okay, when anyone, someone wants to ask what your win percentage is, like if you have a 70% win percentage, but you're only making 10 bets a year, that's like, okay, great. Now you've just profited like whatever amount of profit that is, is not a lot. But if you have like a 55 or 56% win percentage, but you're making a hundred bets a year, that's way better. Um, and so my goal was just to get like the max profit. And so if that meant that we were making like 53, 54 and a half percent expected bets, we would make those. And we would bet a little bit more on the higher perceived value bets. And then, yeah, grind out on the smaller ones. Just like look for every edge and everything was more automated then as well. Uh, yeah, it makes total sense um, when, you, when you look at the numbers that way. But I guess this is the, the parlay into, into who you spoke about earlier, which is you know commonly known as the whiz. Um, you, you went into you know hiring some people. Um, you trialed a bunch, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I had a couple of guys that worked for me beforehand. I, the whiz didn't come in until like 2008 or 2009, I believe. Okay. Second half of I think it was a, I think it was a 2009 season was when we took Ewing live, which was like the other models were good, but Ewing was like the nuts. I mean, it was just a, it was it was so good the first few years. It was just a joke. I remember we had like some new people that, that were making our bets for us, and we lost like the first five or six days of the season, and they were like talking to them like, "Oh, this is not this is shit. Why are we betting this stuff? This is awful." Blah blah blah, and I'd have to like man. I remember, I remember asking the guy to make one more bet on like a, on the Laker halftime. And I was like, are you still here? He's like, yeah, we'll be here until we, lo- until you lose all your money and all our money too. <laughs> Cause the guy was just like such a jerk, right? He was just like a whiny little jerk. And I think we ended up finishing up the first month or the, not the first month, but no, the month of November with like a absolutely absurd ROI. And the guy never, I basically told the guy just next, I was like, ah, just I said, do me a favor, just make the bets and keep the commentary to yourself or we'll find someone else to make our bets. And he's like, okay, I got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> But yeah, there's just a lot of that, like dealing with a lot of different people. But yeah, the the whiz stuff when we we got the simulation going, that was that was when it was it really started to take off a little bit. And that got you to to 2009, where you know you really crushed uh, the second half of the NBA season based on having all that behind you. Correct. Yeah, and then crushed the start of 2000. Uh, I took half a year off in between, so I did some consulting work for a team, 
Actually, the Mavericks. Again. It was the Mavericks because it's, it's noted as anonymous, an anonymous team, so it is confirmed to be. The yeah, Mavericks. I talked about it. I talked about it in the Pablo Torre podcast that I did. But yeah, I worked. I worked for the Mavericks the year. Just started like around a little bit before the trade deadline until the start of the next season. Like Mark, I think was wasn't really. I wasn't getting paid very much money, so it wasn't really. I just kind of wanted to try something different because I was making folks, a lot of money. Well, just so you know, it was not like not a lot of money to him. It was like probably nine seventy five. You know, a million <laughs> two. Just so you know, you know that's probably the number. No, no, I was getting paid. My first contract with the Mavericks was I can't remember. It was under two hundred fifty thousand. Nah, nah. Hundred and two fifty oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Like, stop it in the streets, right? right. No, but I thought, like, I'll take it. I'll do this. I know this guy doesn't know me from anyone, so I'll just take whatever. Just prove, you know, do some stuff. See if he trying to prove myself. I did it for half a year, and I was like, yeah, this isn't. I'm not gonna. And then he, and then he was talking about hiring me for the next year, and I was like, yeah, that's not enough money. Like, I'm not coming back for that. I'm gonna go back to gambling and make some real money. So, yeah, the the business decision, bro. You gotta, you know, he took a he took a pay cut for half a season to see if he liked it. And well, he's about to say, hey, pro, stick to the fucking podcast. I don't want to hear the. I don't want to hear the fucking. uh, I don't want to hear the fucking words. (laughs) I know. I don't like about it. I remember asking. I remember. I don't think I ever disparaged you, pro. You're making it seem like I gave you a hard time. I don't think I. I mean, I think I asked you one time. You were warming up some guy. And he was shooting long twos. And I was like, what do you think the expected value of that shot is? <laughs> you looked at me like I was a fucking alien. <laughs> well, everybody looks at me like I'm an alien. So <laughs> I was just like, okay. I remember I had another conversation with a player too. And he was like, how can you score 0. 0.8 points? That doesn't, it doesn't, it's impossible. You're never going to score 0. 0.8 points. I think DeAndre yeah. Jordan walked by and, and he was getting paid like 25.7 million or something. And I was like, do you want to just get paid 25 and just round off the seven? That's how points work. <laughs> and he was like, oh yeah, I get what you're saying now. <laughs> Yeah. See, I think if you, I think if you busted balls back, you could have been the first in anal- like sort of analytical guy in history to actually like bust a fucking player's balls back. I didn't it mess be, with the players been, though. Yeah. I didn't you really didn't. mess with the players. No, I, you just, didn't. I just, I didn't talk to them. I didn't try to like, okay, coach Carlisle called me up at the start of just to introduce myself. That was, I think the only time I ever said anything to a player. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, every once in a while they'd bring me around and be like, Hey, can you explain something? We're trying to, can you explain to us what you said? And you'd, like, cause there was, there was like the Harrison Barnes thing where I guess Harrison Barnes the previous summer spent the whole summer working on his back to the basket game <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like, like the whole summer literally worked on his back to the basket, like ear rub, all these plays that were mm-hmm. calling for him. And then we were like, okay, we don't want to take as many long twos anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, I think he was, I just think the player was like, okay, well, I wish they would have told me that in the summertime. I would have. No, I, I like, I think you and I had a discussion about it too. Like if you, you know, you could have been the first because I feel as though analytics in the league, like no one explains it to the player. Like they explain it to the coach and staff and the front office and ownership, but not a lot of like one on ones with, play, you know, with the actual player to explain it. And I thought because you, you know, you come across like when you, you when you're engaged in conversation, I think you're really good. And that's why I thought like if 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 that was sort of pushed a little bit that I think the play because I think players sort of are understanding a little bit more of analytics these days obviously because it's pushed down their throat so much but I just think if you explain it and that that could be in such a big deal with them what do you think on that Bob? Yeah I think so I think I think there's a lot of things working against me when I got there that it wouldn't have really mattered what the situation was just because mm-hmm. There was, there was a lot of players, like one thing I didn't realize, like I tried to stay out of the player. I, you know, I would talk to the players just like, hey, like, Hey, how are you doing? Like, congratulations on this, whatever. Like, you know, some have a kid, like congratulations. Or, hey, what's up? How you doing? How was your, how was your summer, et cetera. Right. But I wouldn't really want to talk basketball with them just because I was told by the coaching staff, they didn't want me to talk basketball. And also I just had a lot of respect for people don't think I had a lot of respect for the chain of command, but in terms of coaching, I did like, mm-hmm. I understood the coaches were the coaches. If I had something to say, I would talk to a coach about it. Right. Um, and so, but yeah, I think so. I mean, the part of the problem is like some of the vets that weren't playing, they kind of, they got the impression the reason why they weren't playing was because of me. Like a lot, there's a lot of players thought I was like this spook that was doing all of these things that I wasn't really doing, like controlling. If you, I don't know if you guys read the article that was written, but like a controlling lineups, like you've been around coach Carla, like no coach Carla's not going to fucking have someone tell him how to coach his team. Like it's just not. Mm. you know like yeah, it's, it's just not card, gonna happen it's the card that tells carlisle not you it's that card in his, in his uh suit coat pocket that tells him to rotate. <laughs> yeah but he that's the yeah exactly <laughs> um <laughs> people definitely thought i had input on the on the player card or the lineup card but you know, he would, just like anyone would he would ask like hey who do you, what do you think about this matchup or whatever and you'd give them your information but yeah i mean it, it, i think you're right i mean i don't know i i do think like people yeah i i think 
that having it be, having me be more, more human, I think would have helped a little bit. Yeah. Uh, at the end, at the end of the day, also like, bro, you weren't around for the COVID part of it. Like it was no. such a fucking miserable experience mm-hmm. that nobody wanted to be around anybody for the most part for most of that year. Like right. you're getting up at six in the morning, seven in the morning to get your tests in. You're getting tested sometimes twice a day. Mm-hmm. You're wearing masks all around everywhere you go. So there wasn't a lot of like, it was just, it wasn't like a familial, it wasn't a really interested, you know, you were never going to get to know someone really well during the COVID time. Yeah. I think a lot of people were, were just kind of grinded down from that a little bit, you know, plus the schedule was compressed. You're playing all these games. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I would have liked to have not necessarily yeah. like been able to explain stuff to players, but just like to have been thought of as more of like someone who's got a sense of humor and can, who can bust balls, et cetera. Cause I kind of, <laughs> kind of just kind of yeah. kept to myself a little bit yeah the presentation of you probably could have been better as far as like how they introduce you to the team i think like because no no one really knew what you did they knew the gambling stuff and then they just brought you up there right before you went to shanghai i believe right before you went left for china you spoke to the team but it was more like all right bob tell us what you think and it's like <laughs> all right you know what i'm saying like yeah. it's yeah, you know, sure. yeah yeah that that, that definitely <clears throat> I mean, I heard that so much, like, oh, that was the biggest mistake ever made was having to talk to them. <laughs> like, I definitely heard that a few different times because I do think people are just like, what the fuck is going on? Who is this guy? But I didn't certainly yeah. ask to speak to the team. That's for sure. I, I just kind of wanted, I just wanted yeah. to just kind of like hit, introduce myself. Someone, sure. you know, I think the lowest hanging fruit in basketball is just like, and this is not like super advanced analytics. It's like literally the lowest hanging fruit is don't three. take a foot on the line three pointer or two point right. shot, take a fucking three. That's like, that's as yeah. basic as it gets, but that, I mean, you, you know, that's maybe 3% or 5% of what my impact was on analytics. It just was, that's the thing that kind of got everybody going. It was also the year after uh, Houston went like, Oh, for 27 in that game. And so a lot of yeah. players start asking questions. I remember having a conversation with one player about that. Like, Oh, you can't shoot threes. Look what happened to Houston. I was just like, well, I mean, what if some of those threes went in? <laughs> like, they, they, yeah. you know, like, like it's, I get what you're saying. Like, there's a human impact of missing that many in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also like, you know, they took the best team in the history of the NBA, the fucking seven games on the basis of the fact that they played that way. So it's kind of yeah. hard to, to kind of bemoan the fact that it didn't work out in game seven. No doubt. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think Pro brings up a valid point as well that um, having – you know, being around NBA teams, there's kind of, you know, the NBA is a, a pretty masculine, there's a lot of bravado, you know, I can fight, I can do this, I can do that. And, and that's just a part of the league, right? It's a, it's a grown man sport. So I think sometimes a guy like yourself, H Bob, can be grouped in that kind of nerdy, just stay on your computer, get, the, sure. get the fuck out of our way. So I think there is an onus on, on NBA franchises to explain it better to the players so they're not like what Pro said. And I think there's, there's definitely the majority, over 50% of players would think that way. Or like, who is this nerd that's dictating my playing time? What the fuck? Like, I just, you know, I get buckets or I can do this or I can do that. So there is a, a bit of a disconnect there that probably NBA teams no, need to do a better job of because it's not going anywhere. It's not going away. You know, analytics. No, it's certainly AI, not going. Data. Yeah, it's certainly yeah. not go. Yeah, it's certainly not going away. There's just too much, just too much. There's just too much at stake in order to like discount this stuff. And you can see like the teams that push back on it. They, you know, there hasn't really been any team that's kind of had success, you know, going all in analytics. But, you know, there's, the exception of the Lakers, I think the Lakers bubble team, that was probably like the, one of the least analytically friendly teams to win a championship in terms of how they built their roster. But they also started with LeBron James and, and Anthony Davis. Like you're, you're going to be a good team if you start. That's the other thing about the NBA is no matter how great your analytics are, it's a star league. So no, like no. you can have as many spreadsheets as you want. If you don't have one of the top 10 players in the league on your team, you're just not winning ever. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're the Houston Rockets and you're <laughs> you're jacking up yeah. enough threes and all your numbers are correct, you might win twenty doesn't games matter. instead of fifteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really doesn't matter. Like that. That's the part that's like, and I think I think people like I obviously understand that most people. With, and then again, I don't like the analytics thing. I like more strategy. I like strategy because that's what I felt like I did more strategy stuff. Like I think part of the thing that people didn't realize is I was probably spending seventy to eighty percent of my time watching film. I would be yeah. grinding film all the time. Because that's when you really learn more about like, okay, what are we doing wrong? How can we you know, impact our space? How can our spacing be a little bit better? How can we grind out half a point here, half a point there? What are these matchups? And this, the sample sizes and the analytics aren't, aren't, aren't that big for stuff like that. And I already did all the analytics work before for 15 years. So it wasn't like I had to grind away at analytics anymore. I was mostly just watching film, just trying to learn stuff that I didn't know. Like all our play yeah. calls, all our 
you know, all our defensive coverages, you know, how, what, you know, what exactly went wrong in a play, what, what, you know, we had a, an actual had a program that actually told us where the defensive players should be in a line for mm-hmm. every possession. You know, should you have switched, do you not have switched that sort of, so that's kind of the stuff that I did in the beginning, but whatever it was, it was a fun experience. I enjoyed it for sure. In the first year, there's definitely some highlights, but I, you know, I, I definitely wasn't, it didn't end the way I necessarily wanted it to end. That's, that's, that's for certain. Yeah, and, and just just to cut just to cut this off, bro. Just you know, obviously after um, H Bob had a six month stint with the Mavs, he then went back to betting. Obviously, we spoke about Ewing and um, and even Harden, um, and then had had then transitioned back to an official role with the Mavericks in 2018, which was labelled as the director of quantitative research and development. So that's where that all fits in. So we can just give the listeners a bit of a feel, which which does lead us to our time where. Um, H Bob, myself, Pro, all kind of ran into each other, and and for sure. Yeah, I so guess- I was just to be clear, like I, I, I signed a contract as a team employee uh, the year you the year I met Pro, mm-hmm. and then but two years prior to that, I was a consultant. So I started, I think, like I think Luca's rookie year was two thousand and eighteen, two thousand nineteen. If mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, yeah. Um, so the so I started two years before that, but they were remote kind of consulting. I wasn't really around very much and I, it, I didn't really want to be around. I was like, all right, I'll do this. I'll, I'll see if I like it. And then I went and took a, an actual salaried team job versus a contracted, you know, just a consulting role the year I met pro, which was the 2018, 2019 season. And that was Luca's rookie year. And part of the reason why I came was because they were able to draft him. And I was like, okay, this could be cool. I could see, cause I was a huge Luca guy. And so I just was like, oh, this could be fun. And then I'll, yeah, so that, that was kind of how the timeline went. People, people don't realize that they think I, they think I got there, like, you know, when, when it was announced, but I'd already, you know, I'd already met with Carlisle, the coaching staff, et cetera, two years prior, did some work via email, had some phone conversations, that type of stuff. Yeah. And that, that leads me into my next question is most, you know, you, you were most notably essentially gone from a relative unknown in a consulting role where no one really knew your name, your face, that kind of stuff to now, bang, you're, you're, you know, everyone wants to know who's, who's this H-Bob guy, the guru of sports betting, that analytics you know, data. <laughs> so how did you adjust to that? How did you adjust to now being in the spotlight where, you know, there were, there were articles about, about you, you know, you're sitting courtside and there's photos on ESPN and then that leads us into all the other BS that went on after that. But how did you handle that, that kind of transition? Well, there really wasn't anything written about me other than when I, my, when my hiring was announced, but like I never did any media when I worked for the team ever. I had a bunch of people ask me to do stuff. Never did. Mark never wanted me to do any media. I think they, even people would ask Mark, Hey, can we, before they would get to me, they would ask the team, Hey, can we talk to Bob about something? And the answer would always be no. And I think part of that was because of the awkwardness of the situation, the role. And I think part of it also was I was kind of thought of as like a, I don't want to say a secret weapon, but I think just like this idea, like, okay, we don't want people to know like that this guy's working for us, that sort of thing. So, um, so there wasn't really a ton. I mean, how did it, how did it was a transition? It was kind of boring, to be honest. I was in Dallas going to games, going to practices. I start, I stopped going to practice at some point just because I was like, this is just, I can't, I just can't deal with this. It's just so, <laughs> just, it's just boring. Like, I don't know what else to say. There's, you're not learning very much. So I would, I wouldn't go to every practice. I was, I was going to coaches meetings for the first year. And then we stopped doing that and started having meetings privately because I, I do think my presence in the coaches meeting definitely made some of the coaches meetings go a little bit differently. Cause the one thing that was very clear and maybe pro even got a sense of this i'm not sure i'd be curious to hear your take because it definitely word got around that i was like quote unquote mark's guy and so Mm. instantly my interactions with people were just colored by that you'd have people who would you know kiss my ass because they thought it might help them get ahead in the job you'd have people who would just not in a bad way but just like they really i took the wrong fucking philosophy i I went the other way folks what the fuck now i know why i got shit canned (laughs) but but you you get what i'm saying though right pro like there's definitely there's definitely a lot of people that thought you know, but, hey, I want to move. I want to move up a little bit. Let me just try to treat this guy a little bit differently, or just like agree in a meeting, or or like disagree, but then get scared that they're going to get like bludgeoned to death with data. It was just like a weird, weird dynamic, and, and you know, not a bad thing, but it was just different. Um, yeah, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Like I knew you were Mark's guy. I knew you were around the team a couple years before they they explained you as a you know did the gambling stuff sort of vaguely i think carlisle talked about it a little bit and then you came in and you you were mark's guy again yeah i think some people took both ends of that like they're a little intimidated they probably and then they probably want to keep on your good side you know it's it was funny for as much like clout that people thought you had like you did take this sort of backseat approach where you weren't vocal you weren't like 
you know, vocal where you were like, you know, going off on people or yelling or doing any of that. Yeah, in practice, folks, it was funny. Me and Sham would give each other the wink because, you know, Bob would sit down, I would sit on one end, and now and Sham would sit on the other, and we would bust his fucking balls on purpose and just talk shit with him during practice, like, you know, because me and Sham did our work before and after practice. We didn't do anything, like, really during. And then, um, yeah, Bob really wasn't around. I mean, he just, he walked in with his white hat on, which I fucking love that that was great. <laughs> and then fucking, he came strolling in. That's my brand for the practice facility year two. I almost quit because of it. I'm like, I was like, bro, I got to be able to wear a hat. Like, I yeah. can't be expected yeah. to do my hair at like eight in the morning every day. Like, come on, give me a break. I'm he, barely he came in, came in like he was a fucking golf pro, Bogues, right? And he comes in, <laughs> he just strolls across the court. I, I gave him some like mafia gambling fucking jokes and some player stuff. Me and Sham would talk to him and yeah, he would just be there. So I think most of his work was, but I, I think it's mo- most of his work was behind, you know, behind the scenes and coaches meetings and, and what have you. So yeah, it wasn't like he was a vocal guy the first year that I was there, you know? I wasn't really ever that, which is funny because the article made it seem like I like pissed this person off, pissed that person off, rubbed this guy right. the wrong way. And it's just like, I don't know. I, I took a little bit of like, I thought about this a little bit more and I think like for some type of like people think like, okay, Bob's difficult to work with. And I think like, I don't agree with that at all. I think for some people I can be difficult to work with. Like if you have a certain way about you, it can be difficult. Like if you don't like being, if you like to talk about things, but don't like being challenged, that can be difficult. If someone holds you accountable to the opinions you have in a meeting, but you can't back it up with anything that can be difficult. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, like I always, I just wanted to win basketball games. That's all I cared about. And like, you know, these are the best fucking players in the world at what they're doing. And so if you're not working really, really hard to do whatever your role is okay. to contribute and help these guys get better or help us win games, then like, what exactly are you doing? That's how I took it. Well, you're direct. I mean, you're direct, H. Bob. I mean, you're you're direct. You're you're backed by your research and endless amounts of hours of study you do. So, yeah, I think that's intimidating for some people. Um, and I think the fact that you know you, you'll you'll give your opinion like that's my kind of guy. Like, I'd rather know where I stand. You know, I don't want. And, and sure. the problem in the NBA is, you know, you somewhat have to <laughs> sugarcoat things with certain guys or coaches or staff and. That's what Pro and I always laugh about. Like it's it's very very political, almost almost more so than the White House, which you ended up figuring out the hard way, uh, H Bob, as it, as it went on with your your career in Dallas. For sure, I I just was blown away by it because like I always took like the coaches' meetings as kind of being sacred. Like mm-hmm. you say shit, it stays in the room. Like we're 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 trying to get to the same result, and I, I would say most people had the same attitude. Like not there wasn't like a bunch. Of, I don't want to make people get the wrong impression, but there was definitely some situations where like you could just disagree on certain things, and yeah, people would take it personally for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I mean the direct part is like the other thing is like I don't really talk about stuff I don't know about. Like I'll I'll I don't go I'll, I'll never tell pro how to warm up a player. I'll never tell like I would never be like oh I think. Like, I just don't, there's, I res- like, I would never tell DK how to like cycle on, do like cycle, cycle. Like, I just, there's stuff that I know and there's stuff that I don't know. And I feel like when it comes to a topic that I have domain knowledge of, that I've researched, that I've, that I can actually answer, I'll answer in a way that makes you seem like, oh, why is he so confident? It's because I've done the work. But if there's stuff I just don't know, then I'm not that difficult to, I would just be like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Let me research that. And yeah. Yeah, it's tough, Bob. Like, the money fucks everything up in the NBA because it's so much money. You know, like these coaches are making and all staff, most staff members are making, right? And then it's it ends up being way too territorial. There's too many staff members. There's 5,000 fucking guys around it. There should be probably a quarter of the staff. And now it becomes like, you know, they want to continue to make that money as long as they can. You come along, which you don't really have a border. You don't have a, a lane that you have to stay in it because you could have say in whatever you want to have say in. And I think people just get territorial. Look, and yeah, and that's just sort of, that's sort of what you got to deal with with these organizations. And, you know, you got to massage some people. But the problem is like you are so high up with stuff, right? But again, I think it was a failure to present you correctly. Like, look, this guy is this. You know, not like, oh, this guy's just, this guy just walks around. He's a gambling guy. Da, da, da. No, this guy is important to us. He has say in, in what he cannot be fucked with. Like, he's here for you and us, but he's got a lot. Like, I don't think, at least the first year wasn't presented that way. And I think that that's why it's sort of... Yeah, I think that, that's a good point. I mean, the first year, I think they also just didn't really... 
I mean, they're just kind of getting a feel for me a little bit. I was kind of getting a feel for the job, but yeah, I mean, it was pretty clear once I was there to the people that mattered that I had a big influence on what was happening. I think to your point though, like, yeah, money, once money gets involved, now the other people, now they're worried, okay, is this guy coming for my job? Yeah. How does that work? Like, obviously me, me and Donnie never really had like a bad relationship, but we never had a relationship. Like I never really talked to the guy. And I think mm -hmm. the longer I was there, the more, the more difficult it became for him. And I can totally understand that. But he also, you know, we, you know, whatever, like the, the, the stuff. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a weird situation for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but not in a bad way. I mean, look, I, 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 at the end of the day, like I, I knew I was leaving, uh, around March of the last year. I just knew I wasn't coming back. I told coach Carlisle, I was not coming back. I didn't tell Mark I wasn't coming back, but I told, mm -hmm. I told coach Carlisle, I was not coming back. It was like right after the last time, uh, I guess Luca got upset cause I left early in a game, which I thought to be pretty funny. But that was that's part of the smear campaign that started. Someone leaked it to the media. I mean, th um, that part I don't know if it's overblown because I don't know. I never talked. I left after that. I never. I was never around the team after that. I was like, you know what? I don't need to be a distraction. I'm just going to leave. The first part for sure, where he yelled at me, uh, he did yell at me in the middle of a game. But I didn't like. He he said like, don't ever tell me to calm down or something. But I I wasn't. I never say anything. Like I never would talk. And, like I I never tell players what to do. I'm never like. You know, I'm not sure if Pro were watching me watch a game, but I was never, I never really clapped. I never really like stood up and yelled. I just kind of just sat there like a statue and watched the games. Like it was, yeah. and so, and so he did, he, we did have a thing where he yelled at me and then there was like rumors going around that he, me and him almost came to blows in the locker room after the game or in the garage. And like, that wasn't what happened. He, he yelled at me during the game, uh, then yelled at the bench, whatever. He was upset about something. I was sitting next to Mark. Mark was the one who was like, you know, saying like not bad things but he was definitely vocal during the game and so mm -hmm. uh but like a couple like a week or so later me and luca did have a conversation he did say he did apologize because i was like hey you know i didn't yell i wasn't talking to you in the game right like i don't do that and he's like yeah yeah i know it wasn't you it was mark and so that part was overblown for sure everyone knew that they whoever whoever the source was certainly would have known that that was bullshit but they only wanted to tell half the story not the full part of the story the second part, I don't even really know. Like I got up in the, I got up with like a minute and a half or two minutes left in the game. I don't even remember why I got up, but it wasn't because I was quitting on the team or anything. I just got up to go, go check something on my computer and in my little cubby cubicle, whatever. And then I got the phone call like in the middle of the night from coach Carla. I was like, Hey, you know, Luke, you know, did you hear what happened? I was like, no, what happened now? <laughs> cause there's always something happening. <laughs> I'm like, what happened now? And he's like, Luca got upset cause he left the game early and i was just like are you fucking joking i was like what did you guys say right it was the game was over basically or something right yeah but it wouldn't matter because i would i left i remember i left with like three minutes left or 30 seconds left in the game that we were up that we were down we were up one with like 30 seconds because i wanted to look at something on like a the statistics on like who to foul and stuff like, like i would i wasn't i didn't have a computer with me i had to go to my computer so but yeah that's what happened i got up with like two minutes left when we were down big or maybe 40 seconds left i don't know it was portrayed like i quit on the team but it's like it's not like I went and left in disgust or anything. I just left. I was still I was still around. I still went to the the post meet locker room. I'd always meet with the coaching staff before you know when the when the I'm not sure if you saw that pro, but like the coaches would meet yeah. with the coaching staff yeah, before, for sure. before we were in the locker room. Yeah, I was always in that meeting, and so a lot of times I would want to have something that I would explain, and so I would I would leave a little bit early because I'd want to get that information. Yeah, I don't have any intel on that, Bob. Like, I, I I didn't really hear about that too much except reading about it. I guarantee you I could sort of ballpark it. It was an overreaction by everybody, right? Carlisle probably heard that, like, Luca was a little bit pissed. But he probably wasn't even pissed. It was probably like a ball-busting thing. Or, like, where the fuck's Bob? Just No, I think he was cool. pissed. This is how it was explained to me by, like, someone in the coaching staff and by someone on staff. Is like, he was pissed after the game about something. Yeah. And did not want, just wanted to leave, basically. Didn't want yeah. to talk to any anyone, whatever. I'm not sure exactly. And then, you know, right. part of the thing, like, part of the thing was obviously I was seen to be, like, a Carlisle guy. Mm -hmm. Not, like, there's, like, the coaching staff was a little bit fractured in some ways. And I was sure. a Carlisle, like, I was very loyal to Coach Carlisle. I worked with him very closely. Sure. I was big on the chain of command. And I think some people... Yeah. So it, it was just like, so if you had a problem with me, it didn't necessarily mean you had a problem with me. You might, you might have, but or also if you had a problem with him, it didn't necessarily, it was like, there was just, everything was just kind of co-mingled and I was kind of seen as that faction. Like you can attest to this, like everybody on that bench, whether they were 
whoever they were, whether they were a coach or whatever, they were seated on that bench. Everyone has an opinion on how he should play basketball. No, no. And there was, a, there was a lot of like, there's a lot of like, Hey, we should be doing this. What the fuck are we doing? And so, and I was just always like, what is your job? Oh, you're this. Okay. Then why don't you focus on that and not worry about that and let the coach worry about that. Because I just was like, I don't see the point in like gossiping about stuff like that. And there's a lot of that. And I think that also maybe rubbed people the wrong way a little bit. Like I told one person on staff, like, yo, shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear this anymore. Like, I don't want to hear how you think our offense is, is, is not good. Like you're not an off, like you're mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, right. not in a bad way. Shut the fuck up. But just like, yo, I don't want to hear this. Like let's, we just lost. Let's just deal with it. And so, um, but yeah, I was kind of blown up, whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know to this day. I don't really know if he does like me or dislike me. I, I know that I never had any interaction with him negatively. I never, you know, I never told him to do anything. I never, I was hardly, I just kind of left him alone. I looked at him and I mean, pro kind of mentioned this a little bit. Like I looked at him as kind of like, kind of like Mozart, just kind of let this guy do what he wants to do. Like everyone's kind of scared of him in a weird way. I wasn't really scared of him. I was just kind of like in awe, if that makes sense. I just kind of let him be like, I would never begin to think to tell him how to play basketball or anything. And maybe also, I, but I also didn't really joke around with him either. And I think that might have, it might have been perceived that I was like, that I didn't like him or I, or I was, or, or I wasn't, I didn't try to develop a relationship with him. But the way I saw him was like, everybody was in this guy's back pocket mm -hmm. trying to be his home, his best buddy, because they knew like, if Luca liked you, you were, you were likely to stick around. If Luca liked you, you might even get another contract as a player. Like there was a lot of that. Hey, hey Bob, hey, Bob. Not everybody. <laughs> Not you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that for sure. And so I just, yeah. I just kind of never, I just kind of, I just kind of respected the fact that he was an amazing basketball player and I didn't want to, I didn't want to fuck with him. Like I just didn't, I just didn't want to be, I just kind of left him on his own. And I don't know, like I played the Dirk tennis classic with them. We definitely had like fun doing that, mm -hmm. you know, joked around. We talked about doing like a tennis bet for like some amount of money at some point. But aside from that, I never really talked to him that much. So if he disliked me, then I don't know. I guess that's that's kind of on me, but I'm not really. I'm not losing sleep over it that much either. Well, it's obviously, it's obviously been. It was obviously, obviously a well timed leak too. I mean, the way you know when the, the whole that article came out about yourself and digging into everything that that, that was going on, it, it was clear to me that it was leaked by someone within the organization. And as soon as you attach a leak like that to a Luka Doncic or a LeBron James or a Kevin Durant, that shit's gonna. That's going to be used in Japan, in in, in Australia, for sure. Well, know, they so. put they 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 used his name to sell to 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 get the article to be more you know exactly. more exactly right. And that's that's what I read into more it, flammable, which wasn't yeah. wasn't fair to you. But a quote that you attributed to a previous article, which I guess fits in well with what we're talking about. The, what, this is your quote: "The way I saw it was that anyone who was talented and qualified was marginalized, and it was kind of like an old boys network of guys who were just kind of there to collect checks and stick around. And look, as, as harsh as that may sound, um, it's true. That's the NBA, and, and Pro and I speak about it a fair bit. It's it's the development coach who get, tries to get in with the Luka Doncic and knows that if a coach or GM's fired, he he might hang around because Luca likes him, or KD's guy, or LeBron's guy, or you know, Carlos. How about guy. an assistant coach? How about an assistant coach who wants to get the head coaching job? That happens a lot too. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. You know, if so. you can, if you can drive a wedge between between that and now, and now you're Luca's guy, and now you know the, the, this is. I mean, this is a career move. A lot of these coaches became coaches because they became the interim coach and. Like, you know, there's certain coaches, that's their playbook is being the interim coach, primarily the head coach. And so that's a part of it too. I just never really like, because I wasn't in it for the money. I didn't, I didn't look at it that way. Like I just, I was kind of stupid. I, I was just kind of like, okay, I want to win basketball games. And I thought everyone, I was so oblivious to it, but that's also part of like the, the disconnect I have with like the average person in some ways, just because like I've already achieved a level of wealth where money doesn't really factor into it for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. For sure, bro. No, financially, Bob, like, you're, pro you're obviously killing it on the gambling side. Why join a team full blast where you have to give up all that other stuff just to just to work for an NBA team where you, you could have, like, you had the money to be, you know, you could have sat courtside wherever the fuck you wanted and just sort of chilled and had a, you know, enjoyed yourself and still did your gambling stuff. What, did you want to be, did you, like, have aspirations of running a team? Did you just want to be around a team? Like what, is, what yeah, was I wasn't really like? sure to be honest. I mean, first off, I love basketball, like love it. And yeah. so it was always a dream of mine to work for a team, you know, whether it was like a run a team or whatever. I just, I just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was, I, I, I didn't really, 
I mean, looking back, I didn't put a ton of thought into it. And it sounds really silly, but like, it was kind of like a spur of the moment. I think I had flown back from Greece, direct from Greece to Dallas, met with Mark and had a handshake gr- agreement, like within six hours on no sleep. That's kind of how it went down. And right. then I was like, okay, I mean, I, I was engaged prior to that. The engagement fell apart. I was like, kind of just questioning, what am I doing with my life? Like I'm so, I was so over gambling. Gambling mm-hmm. is like, okay, I was making eight, 10, whatever, 15 million a year, but it just wasn't That's it. It just, whatever. No, but it just like, yeah, dude, whatever. it wasn't changing. Like it wasn't changing <laughs> yeah. my life in any way. I was like, okay, what do you do with the money? Will you put it with the rest of it? It's like, it wasn't yeah. like really, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd been involved in crypto already at that point. Crypto was making gambling look like it was like miniature car racing. It was just so, so trivialized. Like the crypto right. swings are so much bigger than, so yeah, I don't, to answer your question, I just wanted to try something different. I shouldn't have, what I shouldn't have done is I shouldn't have signed a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. I should have signed like a one year contract because Mm -hmm. I didn't really think that through, but I agreed, I agreed to a three year deal. They wanted me to line up with some of the members of the coaching staff. So our contracts ran concurrently. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, that was kind of the impetus of it. It wasn't like, I don't, it's not, it's probably not the answer you want to hear because I just didn't really put much. I don't know why I just kind of did it. It was kind of spur of the moment. We did it, got there on. And then when I was there, I was like, what am I, I mean, people kind of also got this right. Like I, it's not like I spent the whole year in Dallas. Like I, the first year that I got so bored while I was there and I was just felt like, okay, I got to get out of here for like a week or something. Cause I can't, I'm not being like, when you guys would go on the road, sometimes I would just like jet off to Mexico or something and mm-hmm. put my work in there and come back. And, but I was always working very hard. Like there's nobody that could say like, if they, if a coaching staff member didn't reach out to me for a question, they wouldn't get a response back. If I was awake, like if you, if you messaged me before 10 o'clock at night, you're going to get an answer like within five minutes, almost every time. Right. After 10, I just, I, I just turned my phone off because I just wasn't dealing with it after 10. But prior, you know, prior to 10, I was just always around, super committed to it. But yeah, I, don't, I, I wouldn't, I would, going back, I would not, I would not have, uh, why did I do it? I don't know, man. I have no idea why I did it. I wish yeah. I didn't. In some, well, <laughs> do you, like want, I, do you yeah, want some experience with an NBA team? Because do you, I don't know if you still have these aspirations, but when, when we chatted previously, you, you know, you've noted that yeah, if, if, if Bitcoin, if Bitcoin hits a hundred K that you'll be the new owner of an NBA team, still, still that motivation? A little bit. Yeah. I'd like to own an NBA team. Having the experience is definitely, you don't want to go into it and not have any experience for sure. But yeah, that, that was part of it. You know, I, 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 I at one point I wanted to be a general manager when I was younger so I thought, well, let me just try to check this off and see if this is something I'd be interested in. I quickly learned very Not early anymore. on that it's just <laughs> it's just too much. I mean, I mean, me and you used to talk about this in private, but it was like a couple yeah. of years ago or when we first started playing poker. It's just like, dude, these guys do not have good lives. Like they mm-hmm. are phone attached to both ears, two phones. Like, you know, Daryl Morey's aged like a president in the last like 15 <laughs> years. I mean, it's just like it's never ending. And I think there's a, there's a certain, I have a lot of admiration for people who are able to do that, but it's not, you know, I, I I would rather not do that. I just, I just think it's just too much. Um, but owning a team would be cool. Yeah. That, that's so something that's still, that is that is still the, 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 the short, medium, long-term goal for you? Like would that be, that'd it's be- a goal of mine for, it's a goal of mine. I don't know if I'll end up ever doing it just because it's like these teams trade so infrequently and the teams that do trade aren't like the Timberwolves deal. I was a pretty good deal for whoever bought that, like for Mark Laurie and, and, well, and how, do you like, how do you like Phoenix? Decent city. Cause that, that, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, that, that <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah, that there's just, there's just so few places I'd want to live to answer your question. So it's, it's it, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but yeah, I'm definitely, it's definitely something that keeps me grinding a little bit. You need, you need, you need goals to keep working, I think. And so that's definitely a goal. So, you know, make that happen at some point, but whether it happens or if it doesn't happen, that's, I'm fine with that too. I, I'm not, I'm not tied. Also, I'm not tied to the NBA. I could see myself owning another franchise with a different team and different sport, just because I do like the idea of building a culture from the top, doing things the right way, especially after what I've learned. Um, I feel like I've learned some valuable lessons a- along the way. Yeah. But, fair enough. Uh, is it Phoenix? Yeah. Fe- Phoenix, uh, that's an interesting one for yeah, sure. Yeah, it could be up in, in the next couple of weeks. Just make sure you hire a pro. But let's finish this off. I'm not going to hold you too long. I just want to get pick your brain on a few NBA things. For sure. You've been watching the NBA, obviously. Who do you like right now? We're, we're 10, 10, 15% into the season, so it's still the honeymoon period, as we say. But um, who do you like right now? Who do you think will be there at the end that probably people aren't talking about? Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, I like the way Miami's playing. Look, they're seven and two. I still think Philadelphia is a team that people have to look out for if they ever get anything for Simmons. I mean, they're already pretty good. I mean, Golden State, uh, I was not a Golden State guy going into the season. I do think 
they've changed their 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 offensive style a little bit. I don't know how much of that has to do. With, you know, I mean, some people have said Kenny Atkinson's had an impact. I'm not sure, but they're you know they're shooting a lot more threes. Where if you have like like Steph Steph Curry should just be shooting a ton of threes. He's not. I mean, you played with them both. Yeah. You know. So I don't. I mean, yeah. I I think there's more of like who I don't like. Like I don't like the Lakers. I don't think the Lakers yeah. are a team that is going to be like the NBA champion. I, I don't see that roster being good. I'm not a huge fan of Phoenix. I think Phoenix was a little bit lucky last year to have things go the way they went. But yeah, who would I, who would I, if I had to pick one team right now, I would probably roll with like Milwaukee. I think the East is just much stronger. Yeah. So I'd probably roll with like a Milwaukee or Miami as the two best teams in the league right now. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Golden State. I think Jordan Poole, the emergence of Jordan Poole has been huge for them. Um, and I'm, I'm excited actually to see if Clay comes back healthy. That's a pretty big three-headed monster, monster you've got on the on the wing there. But um, they've definitely been playing well. And defensively, Miami and Golden State, their numbers, um, you know, it is a honeymoon period. So we, we try not to put too much in, into the basket right now. But um, yeah, I would agree. For sure. So much can change. And what about this? What do you? How do you feel about like what Golden State's doing in terms of like trying to thread the needle between you know, keeping these young players and also having a chance to win a ch- like, You know how hard it is to win a championship. I don't, but you do. Yeah, that's, and it's that's like the hardest they thing. have a chance. Like, why? Why? I, I don't get you. Know, like, Curry's at a certain age. I feel like you're doing him a disservice by not trying to win a championship right now and doing everything you can to do it. Because this guy's. I mean, how old is he? He's not. You know, he's like in his thirties, thirty something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, like thirty. Yeah, thirty, 30 thirty-three. 30, He'll be thirty-four in March. Yeah. So yeah, like he's got another year or two at this level probably, and then he'll start to dwindle yeah. a little bit. So I, I look at it and, and he's at the top of his game, which is surprising to me, but he really is. I, I would be really, really looking to like I wouldn't be trying to hold on to Kaminga, Wiseman, Moody, etc. Like I'd be I'd be trying to move some of these. I would have been trying to move some of these draft picks, but that's just me. Look, they they do things their own way. They've already won multiple championships. So they obviously know what they're doing. It's just such a tough. It's a tough argument, isn't it? Because you want. You want longevity where you success. Do you want longevity for ten years, or would you take a championship in that ten years and be kind of shitty for five and then okay for four? And most people would say the championship, to be honest, because they're so hard to come by. But it's that's the age old debate that GMs and owners have: is you know, do you do you end up like Cleveland? I think you have to take a championship. Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. That's why we, you know, we were we were looking, we were talking about the the Wiseman for Wiseman and Player X, maybe Wiggins, for, you know, Bradley Beal back back when Beal was somewhat on the table and. That was my argument was, you know, Steph's not going to want to be part of a team um, that's just treading water and developing and going to be a five, six, seven, eight. He wants to win a championship. So does Draymond Green. So does Clay Thompson. So, I mean, I'd like to see them do something potentially. Will they? Who knows? I don't know what the motivation is, but it's, it's just that it's just such an interesting topic of discussion with these kind of teams that are, you know, kind of in the middle. Now they're surging back up. They've got aging stars. Do you end up then being left with a, a bag of bad contracts trying to surround around um, Steph like Cleveland did with LeBron and then and LeBron leaves anyway and then they're back in a rebuild and their rebuild arguably could take an extra three, four years and it's supposed to because they're left holding the bag with bad contracts. Is that argument as well? It's just it's just so tough to make sure. Well, the, well Cleveland thing though is just is just so I mean that, that Cleveland had no choice because they're never ever winning a championship without LeBron anyways. Mm-hmm. And that was it. And so like that no one's going to Cleveland. No one's like, hey, I'm, I'm I've made my decision this off season. I'm gonna sign with the Cleveland Cavaliers. But they would have when LeBron was around. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think they had to do something. And Golden State, if Golden State hadn't already won a championship, if those that ownership group hadn't already won multiple championships, they probably have a different attitude right now than they do. But once you've won multiple, it just makes it a little bit more. You can be a little more prudent. But I think you are doing a disservice to those guys, to, to Clay and Draymond and 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 staff. But who knows? Maybe they feel differently. Maybe the players themselves. I'm just. I'm. Not, I'm. I don't mean to be speaking for them because I've obviously never talked to them about this. But. Um, that's how I see it. I would I would be trying to win at all costs. I don't think they're good enough to win. They don't have enough depth. Not right now. Yeah, they're a piece away. Yeah, yeah. And so, like the you know the talk for them would be Simmons. Would Simmons help them? Like, how do you find Simmons matching up with Draymond? I mean, by the way, if you get Simmons, it's not like you're left with a bad contract. He's still like quite young, and you can you can arguably build around him a little bit. But in your world, in your world, Bob, does he fit? Like he can't make free throws. He doesn't want to shoot threes. And let's not even talk about the attitude stuff and qu- you know quitting when adversity hits. Yeah, I think that's more of the question. He, analytics do like him. Like, yeah, he doesn't mm-hmm. shoot threes, but it doesn't matter when he's on the court. He's one of the. He's probably like I watch. I went to the game. We I went to all the. Like he 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 takes a special 
he took a special liking to guard Luca and he shut that guy down. I've never seen anyone guard Luca like he guarded him in the one game we played last year in Philadelphia. He is a transcendently good defensive player. Mm-hmm. And that alone is worth a lot in the playoffs, as you guys know. Now, if he's scared to shoot and shoot free throws, that's a problem. If he has mental problems. That's a problem. If he's a diva. That's a problem. I don't know if he's any of those things. I mean, he's certainly mm-hmm. afraid to shoot free throws and, and shoot threes, but I don't know about the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. I worry with adversity with him. I don't, I think with Simmons right now, trade value wise, you know, the, I think the best trades he's going to get is McCollum or Buddy Heald. So maybe if you throw some of those young players in with Wiggins, maybe it makes sense. But, you know, it's, that's I, the other yeah. part is when Phil, Golden State doesn't really have any contracts to match up with them. Like, I don't think Philadelphia is eager to, eager for Andrew Wiggins. They're not like rubbing their hands together waiting for no. the Andrew Wiggins deal to happen. And I don't think the younger players are good enough. No, it has to be a three, has to probably be like a three way deal in some, in some ways. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting to think about. I don't know. I, 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 I am high on some teams higher than mm-hmm. others. Like I, but it's so, like you guys said, it's so early that I'm just more like watching all the different coaching changes. There's been so many coaching changes this summer and watching how they're doing and watching like how Udope is coaching and watching how Phillips is coaching and watching how, you know, Orlando Mosley's coaching. I find that to be really interesting because you do learn a lot about a player a coach early on just based on how what type of stuff they emphasize early so but yeah no no real like dark horse nba champion whatever i i think philadelphia is a decent dark horse mm-hmm. but they're you know they need to make that that's only incumbent on them making a move and getting another player yeah mm-hmm. and, that's, and that's why that's hearing more his comments are just mind-boggling that you know obviously he's posturing about keeping him for four years but Joel and b's not getting any younger they've been through the process which they never want to get to again with with mb on the roster they need to do something soon and yeah their window their window slowly closing arguably you know they've got some a talented roster with a top 10 player on their roster they need to they need to try to win now yeah you, you could have you could argue that they could have I don't know what the what the what the situation was last year for Lowry, but I mean last year was the year where it was open, wide open. Mm-hmm. You, you, they had Lowry on their team instead of George Hill, who they picked up at the deadline. So they could be could be talking about something completely different right now. But but yeah, that's what I got on that. Not not a whole lot, but that's that's kind of my views on the NBA right now. One thing I'm going to leave you with to pick your brain. You're usually pretty decent at these. Give us a player that you think is 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 just not getting enough time right now by by the numbers and data that you look at. Give us a, a young player in the NBA that you think is going to be much better than they are right now. Besides obvious of of, of a rookie, but, but someone maybe that second third year that's stuck behind someone in a rotation that you look at his numbers and you're like, shoot, if this guy got more minutes somewhere else, he's going to be a star. You got anyone for us? Yeah, I mean the guys I like are are kind of getting recognized now, but like a guy that I always liked was Caruso for the Lakers. Like, like are you sure that like, that that that's a guy I find to be underrated? So he's one that I think. But another guy is DeAnthony Melton for Memphis. He's like wild, I think wild, wildly underrated. Kind of like a jack of all trades, defensive type of guy. Not a great on ball defender, although not a bad on ball defender. But he's he's a really good scheme defensive player. Very smart. Those would be those guys that I like. Um, Aside from that, uh, I can't really think of any off the top of my head that I would say are super, super underrated or anything. Yeah, those would be the two guys that would that would just like they're kind of like defensive guys. Those would be the guys that come to mind offensively. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm interested in seeing TJ Warren coming back from injury to see how he plays in Carlisle's system. I think that'll be interesting to watch. He's obviously a very skilled offensive player. It'll be mm-hmm. interesting how they how they utilize him. But those are the guys I would have, I would say off the top of my head, that are kind of underrated by traditional media or 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 that are actually quite good yeah yeah fair enough all right pro thanks h bob um really appreciate it i think it's some your stories yeah thanks for having me on guys yeah for sure pro it was was good talking yeah it was good talking to you again man i hope you're doing well save here everything save here brother i'm I'm on i was in manhattan beach walking the beach i thought maybe i'd see you but you know i don't know if you're in stad or fucking (laughs) china i don't know where the fuck you are It'd be probably I'm probably, probably Malibu if you're walking the beach. Up there. Oh, that's how. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. I, I'm only in the three comma section. I'm in a little bit of a fucking wrong section for you. Bogues, are we gonna are we gonna get back on the PLO streets pretty soon? We got some more heads up matches. You got any uh, time for some heads of those? Up. Not not you. Man, heads up. You're, you're too good. Heads up, man. I gotta gotta stay away from you. But um, you gotta. Right, is the game is the, are the games good? Are they are they worth? Playing? I haven't been should playing. I, get, I download I've, the I've app? on and off. I've, I've played a little bit and then quit and then played a little bit and then quit. <laughs> I've, I've rage quit twice in the last. Three months and then got back on the horse. <laughs> uh, but okay. you know how it is. We, we, yeah. For those wondering, we play uh, 
pop limit Omar on on, a, on an app, and uh, it can get addictive. Where you where you all of a sudden played six hours, and you you don't realize what time it is. But um, H Bob's not the best guy. I, I just quit cold turkey. I was just taking up too much of my time. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I get it's it. Just, and the yeah. fact that you had spreadsheets on all of us with all the data and how many times we follow <laughs> and post, and I'm just like, this guy's yeah, like exactly ten steps ahead of us, man. I gotta stop playing. But yeah, thank, thanks for your time, man. Really appreciate it. It's a great story for our listeners, and we'll catch you next time. Appreciate you guys.